Okay, thanks, uh, Eric. Um, just want to uh, highlight uh, um, the collaborators on this. Keith mentioned some of them that were actually in the on the uh, each of the panels that were uh, uh, convened by Squirp to address this issue, not only in recycled water but also for for surface water uh, inputs. Uh, Nancy, uh, Keith, as well, uh, myself, Shane, and, and Sandy have all been sort of uh, tasked with coming up with uh, trying to come up with a, a group of bioassays that could be utilized for this particular uh, proposed uh, uh, use in in, in monitoring. Um, and as Keith mentioned, there we're basically located throughout the country. So and um, uh, and we have some international collaborators, which also will uh, will be mentioning a little bit later. But just wanted to highlight our, our collaborators on this. So uh, why why do we need to use biological screening? Um, well, a lot of this actually um, is a process that's come out of uh, the EPA because they have the same issue with trying to determine safety of compounds um, and realizing that there's just no way that we can do all of the tests, particularly whole animal tests that were out there that, that are needed to do safety. So one of the best ways is to try to screen chemicals with specific, specific what we call adverse outcome pathways or modes of action that would that lead to uh, sort of toxic endpoints. And so kind of using that lead uh, we thought maybe this might be a good way to apply that same strategy of using a high throughput uh, uh, biological system to to focus our efforts on compounds that really affect the biology and not necessarily may not have any impact at all on the biology that we don't need to monitor. So the idea is uh, to use these these ultimate endpoints that would uh, present uh, adverse outcomes. They would also indicate bioavailability, and this is a, a key issue that uh, um, just because you measure a compound in the environment doesn't necessarily mean it actually gets into a biological system. As Keith mentioned, a lot of these compounds are water-soluble, so not necessarily would be accumulating in organisms. So just because a compound's there doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be taken up into an organism, or even us for that matter. Um, and the other thing that uh, these these systems do is they actually include uh, the mixtures and unknowns of compounds that we don't have standards or we don't have analytical uh, chemistry methods for. So it tries to encompass the whole system um, and tries to um, uh, look at interactions including things that are synergistic, things that are antagonistic, or things that are additive in terms of how they may affect a biological system. And overall, the idea here um, is, again, is to try to come up with a, a commercially viable option of a high-throughput system that, uh, that is easy to use by most uh, uh, agencies that, that need to do the monitoring. So that was, again, in our back of our minds in, ter in terms of how to, uh, to find these things. Um, this is the list. Now, th this particular... Uh, uh, grouping of assays that I'm going to talk about are not really uh, pertinent to the uh, the surface water systems that Keith mentioned, but we hope to apply them to that system. But what we were first charged with was to develop these primarily for uh, recycled water evaluation. So, um, so we based a lot of the selection of the assays that we selected uh, based upon the list of compounds that came out of that initial blue ribbon panel that uh, came up with a list of compounds for recycled water. And I have this list here. Um, the orange compounds were those that were uh, indicated, again, using a risk-based framework on uh, human health endpoints. The green compounds were those which were indicator compounds that would indicate uh, some other chemical classes, not necessarily on a, a health-based uh, risk assessment, but primarily based upon exposure that we know these compounds are there and that they indicate uh, we can get a pretty good under, understanding about the quality of the of the water that is present based upon those indicator compounds analytically. So what we tried to do was take this into account and and adapt that to biological systems that would actually measure those uh, compounds as much as possible. So uh, the study, our objectives and goals were again to identify some promising bioassays and what what endpoints to use. And like I said, we tried to to pick endpoints that were relevant to 
monitoring uh, lists that were already coming out, like the list I just showed. Uh, we were going to optimize those um, through, uh, again, more of a, a, a round-robin system where we would each uh, group in the each uh, lab in that group of, of collaborators would take on a bioassay, optimize it, and then we would then uh, do a blind round-robin testing to, to check out uh, QAQC, um, also to look for ease of use, robustness, and I'll get into some of those things a little bit later. Uh, the other thing was to also just, so what if you get a hit? What does that mean? Um, so our, our goal is to eventually provide some interpretive guidance for uh, what, what do these things actually tell you? Uh, is it just uh, exposure? Or can these actually be used to get an effect threshold that uh, can be used, again, for, for regulatory purposes or for risk-based uh, purposes? Um, the idea, the overall thing, is to try to transfer this to stakeholders. So this was, again, has always been in the back of our minds. We tried to you know, focus on systems that could be easily adaptable to utilities and water agencies um, that already have the skills and or equipment necessary to do this. So we didn't want this to be a huge investment for multiple agencies, but we wanted to do something that was uh, easily available and, and somewhat inexpensive. Um, in terms of selecting the bioassays, as I mentioned, uh, we, we try to get these mode of action classifications. Again, these are based on the list of compounds that we already had, the hormones, for example, such as estrogen, um, some of the other pharmaceutical agents like gemfibrozil. We knew there are um, uh, in vitro methods for these compounds available commercially, so we, we targeted those first. Uh, just so that you're aware, there's about, I think the last count I heard, there's 600 different in vitro assays that EPA is using in their screening process. You know, we, we were, I think we got eight. So, um, you know, the, the sky's the limit in terms of how far you want to take this. But um, but we wanted to start simple and sort of go through baby steps and, and, again, focus on the compounds that we knew had to be monitored, at least were recommended for monitoring. Um, in going through this process, a lot of this was literature-based in terms of looking through what, uh, what in vitro systems work, uh, what have been used in the past to get uh, fairly robust uh, responses. Uh, we've uh, Squirp uh, convened a, a very nice uh, um, round or uh, um, uh, scientific session where uh, we invited Australian folks to come and because they're doing the same thing and, and trying to you know put our heads together and, and see which which systems work and, and in fact we are involved in a in, in a round robin system with uh, with Australia um, doing the same sort of uh, blind compounds or, or extracts that they're sending for this. We also invited uh, various vendors and, and looked through their material in terms of what uh, they could provide, the sensitivity analysis and things of that nature, um, um, support, things of that nature that, uh, that someone who would be using these, these types of systems would, would require. We actually interviewed the vendors. Um, we looked to see whether or not they were uh, commercially available, as I mentioned, and uh, again, what, how much help could be provided in this, in this process. The initial list, uh, which I've shown here, uh, this was not the final list, as I'll, I'll get to it in a minute, but again, we wanted to match this, this list, the endpoints with our indicator compound. So as you'll see, mo many of these compounds were on that list. There were two that were not uh, the, the progesterone activity compound, levonorgestrel, and uh, the androgenic activity, dihydrotestosterone, were not on that original list, but uh, based upon... Um, some recommendations in the ecosystem panel, we thought that uh, these two added uh, endpoints should probably be added um, uh, for, uh, for monitoring as well. Um, and again, the idea was to match this to an indicator compound, have a reference toxicant, which in many cases was that indicator compound, and then look and search to determine whether or not the bioassays that measure those compounds were available by the various uh, vendors that were out there. And so I'll go through these here in a minute. I do want to highlight, again, triclosan, which is present here, was one of the compounds, and, and we knew that that was, had some thyroid hormone activity. It was also, uh, I believe, listed on one of the, um, on the Australian NWC panels, or, or and definitely inter uh, indicated in the EPA uh, endocrine disruptor screening and testing program. So we initially indicated that one as a, as a, uh, a concern or as a priority endpoint. 
Um, but going through the process of, of vetting these things, um, a lot of these things sort of changed a bit. So I'll go through that process here. So how does it, how do these things work? Um, the idea would be is you basically use cells that can either be stored uh, in uh, a frozen situation. Uh, that's basically division arrested. Uh, the idea would be to seed those in a, uh, again, a very, tech, a very cookbook sort of manner where you add a certain number of cells into um, uh, a well. And down here you can actually see what it, this is a 96 well plate that you would then add an X amount of cells to these to these wells, you would add an organic extract to that, that well and then look for a signal. Uh, that signal could be a flash of light or some other form of, of, of uh, measurement that could be easily measured in a, and again, in a high throughput, massive uh, quantity type of, of approach. Uh, the idea here is very simple. If you have a CEC and it uh, is able to cross the membrane, again, bioavailable, if the compound is bioavailable, able to cross the membrane, get into that, that system, and interact with uh, that receptor that that chemical is made to bind, you should get a lighted response. And this lighted response could then be easily measured in, again, in a, in a mass quantity type of approach. And if, if you are lucky and everything works well, you get something that is down here on this, this figure. This was a student of mine who actually did a literature search and compared uh, bioassay uh, um, endpoints, so these EEQs are for estradiol equivalency values that measure the amount of estradiol that binds this particular ligand and gives off this light. You can quantify that using a dose response curve and then compare that to the analytical chemistry that was measured in those particular samples. And what you can see is you can pretty much predict about 80% of the chemical estimated estrogens, and that's not just estradiol, that's estrone, that's all of these mixtures of compounds that were present in, this, in each of these data points. And you can see that the only times that you're mainly off the line are where you actually have false positives, and that's essentially what you really want in terms of a screening procedure. Um, you don't want too many false negatives, which you see here in the low end of the, of the spectrum. But with this, this means that you actually are sort of um, covering all ends. So you're actually seeing biological activity that you may not have analytical methods to determine the chemistry for. So that's what this figure is basically showing. So, all right, so how do we uh, do these comparisons? As I mentioned, we look for relevance, uh, looking for these particular uh, links to the pathways, and whether or not these endpoints, these molecular receptors, had any bearing on sort of higher, order, higher, higher organism responses. That's what we call apical endpoints. So these would be things like cancer, like reproduction, um, again, health-based endpoints that you can actually translate the, the, the molecular event to, to a, a more uh, tangible whole, whole organism uh, endpoint. Um, could these be translatable? And as I mentioned, one approach is actually using equivalency values, and I can go into that in more detail later. But um, uh, this is a way to quantify that biological response so that you can allow comparisons between various samples. Uh, were the are the bioassays robust? Is there specificity? For example, is that receptor only going to pick the compounds that are specific for that receptor? Is it sensitive? Can it be as sensitive as a chemical? Uh, analytical chemistries uh, based approach. Uh, how reproducible is that? Uh, how can, are there things in that matrix that interfere with it, with the compound or that response? Um, we needed to look whether or not the, the bioassay itself, um, whether we needed uh, certain biological characteristics, for example, were the cells stable, were they transient? And again, it, using the literature, was there very good evidence that, that uh, uh, these things would work, and I would use the estradiol or the estrogen receptor as an example of, of a historical usage that's actually turned out to be pretty pretty useful for a lot of folks. Um, as I mentioned, we didn't want to put anything too too uh, 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 difficult for people to do. We tried to target this towards uh, agencies that uh, already do, for example, microbiological testing. So the only real skill set that you would 
be required would be that of of uh, sterile technique, for example. Again, many of these things tend to be uh, kit-driven, and that's why we were sort of targeting things that were already commercially available as kits. So we wanted something that didn't have a lot of cost or time uh, required for setting that up. And I, again, we mentioned the vendor support. That was very important for, for uh, selecting these things. So the idea for each group in the collaboration was to optimize these bioassays without a matrix. So again, this is just taking chemicals themselves, and I'm going to show you that data here in a minute, and whether or not uh, what the sensitivity is like. Um, we do these in a dose-response relationship that allows us to determine sensitivity. Then the idea would be to validate those with water samples. And uh, uh, Dr. Schneider actually has been responsible for coming up with a method of extraction for uh, water and uh, has sent us a blind uh, sample that each laboratory will actually then eventually uh, test to see whether or not we all get the same results. So uh, going through that exercise, uh, the list was actually revised to a certain degree, and uh, as I mentioned, we've, uh, we've got androgenicity and progesterone still there. Our indicator CECs are still in, in discussion. We're still thinking of using dihydrotestosterone here, and uh, probably testosterone, as I'll show you some of the data here for, for progesterone activity. One that we took off and, and switched was the thyroid uh, activity, and that was primarily, again, because of our uh, interactions with Australia and the literature indicating that the thyroid receptor just doesn't work really well in terms of what they're trying to, to do. And they were actually getting very good results with glucocorticoid activity, so we decided to, to switch that one out. Um, and then the others were uh, essentially the same. Each of these, I should also point out, requires a cytotoxicity component that you have to make sure you're not killing the cells before you actually uh, measure the response. So we also look at, at just general uh, to toxicity that occurs within the cell lines for each of these. So. Here's some data. This is our estradiol uh, one, uh, the, the group that we went with in Vitrogen, um, our life uh, technologies, uh, had a number of these, these assays available, and so Gene Blazer is the one that we decided to go with. Uh, again, many of these are ready, readily available kits that you can purchase, and all we were doing was just seeing whether or not uh, there were any, uh, uh, any modifications that need to be made, particularly with cell number and things of that nature. So what, we're, what I'm showing here is a dose response. We have estradiol down here looking at the concentrations that, uh, that elicit a response. And you can see that uh, about one part per trillion, which is one nanogram per liter, and that is biologically active for a thionyl estradiol, uh, we actually can pick up fairly readily using this assay. Um, uh, so this was very encouraging. Uh, for, for this particular one. The, uh, the next one is the androgen assay. And so again, what we did, this is just showing some of the modifications that we made in terms of cell numbers, trying to optimize these things. And you can see here that this is not as sensitive as the estradiol uh, receptor is. In fact, you don't start seeing really significant uh, signal, signaling here until about to, to the uh, 10 to the minus 9 level, which again is a little, it's about an order of magnitude off of where we would see estradiol. Um, what this means is that the extract that, uh, that we are using may have to be modified and, and maybe have to be a little bit more concentrated to measure androgenic activity. Uh, this is uh, an endpoint, the P53 is a uh, tumor suppressor gene, so this would be uh, pertinent for cancer based uh, endpoints. This, again, uh, using various cell, type, uh, cell numbers, we're able to see that you do have some response, but it's way, way, way down here um, in terms of sensitivity. You're not seeing anything really uh, statistically significant until you're, you're about down into 10 to the minus 6. And again, compounds, we're, we're thinking more would be in this area, at least uh, if not here for most of these compounds. So this one's sort of on the fence in terms of uh, whether or not this is actually going to be useful or not, whether or not we want to go through the, the concentration component in terms of that water extract to get that signal. Um, this is uh, progesterone, and as I mentioned, the reason why we left off uh, levo, uh, north, uh, um, levo uh, uh, north edrone was because 
uh, we really didn't see much of a response with that compound. And in fact, what we did see a fairly good response was with progesterone itself. Uh, again, this just seems to be fairly promising. We're in about the 10 to the minus 8 region, but again, we'd really like to see things about right around in this area um, in terms of what's out there environmentally. Uh, so again, it's something that we have to play with with regard to the the extract. Uh, again, the glucocorticoid receptor, this is what we traded the, the uh, thyroid uh, receptor for. We actually are seeing some fairly uh, sensitive responses in the 10 to the minus 9 region. And uh, some of the work that uh, Dr. Snyder and our collaborators in Australia have seen, uh, this is, is actually be looking very promising in terms of an indicator for these this type of responses. This would be, again, an endocrine-based response that uh, is highly uh, uh, correlated with growth, immune function, particularly immune function, which is very important for not only uh, human health but also uh, 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 wildlife as well. Uh, another genotoxicity assay uh, is this assay. It's called the UMU assay. This is a DNA repair-based uh, assay. So whenever a DNA gets damaged, you actually uh, uh, this uh, um, system gets activated, and you can uh, basically evaluate DNA lesions uh, through this method. Our, our compound of interest in this case was in NDMA, which uh, again was one of our health-based uh, uh, compounds for monitoring. And you can see this this assay really doesn't really do very well. I mean, again, we're down here in the 10 to the minus 6 region with a positive control. And then even with a compound such as benzoapyrene, which we know is a very strong mutagen, uh, we're seeing very low uh, signal uh, there in terms of signal to noise. And even our other compound, uh, using it in NDMA, we're not seeing anything uh, on anything. So this one would be an example of an assay that we probably would not recommend for, um, for monitoring. Um, and here's, uh, again, another bad news. The whole reason why we do these things is to determine what, which things will work and which ones won't. The AH receptor pathway is, again, one that uh, works specifically for compounds like dioxins and uh, coplanar PCBs, 126 being an example. We do see a response with, uh, with 126, but again, it's very, very uh, insensitive. And BAP, again, which is a, another AHR receptor agonist, we're not seeing any response. So um, this one would be, and, and one other note, thing to note is the signal to noise, we're actually seeing a very high background in our uh, controls. So uh, this would be an example of another uh, assay that probably will not go forward, at least uh, as it stands right now. So I just wanted to show you kind of, you know, the things that work, the things that don't work. Um, our next steps, uh, again, are trying to, to optimize uh, the intercalibration with, with testing water extracts to see whether or not we do get hits. These have been extracts that actually have chemical analysis associated with them, so we know what's in there. and so this will be sort of our real uh, real test to see whether or not these things would work, at least in, in the drinking water extract. Um, the idea would be then eventually to translate these into these equivalency values using, again, the, the receptor ligand that's res specific for that, that, uh, that bioassay. So, for example, if we're looking at uh, gl a glucocorticoid response, we would use uh, dexamethasone uh, equivalents to, to uh, set that up. So whatever that ligand we use in the dose response curve would actually be our metric for quantifying the, the response. Um, again, the idea would be to investigate these to, to triggering levels. Uh, uh, some of the endpoints, for example, the estrogen receptor things, uh, you can get some fairly meaningful results using EEQs. We've used TEQs for HR receptors for a long time in, in the same strategy for, for using trigger levels, so we figure we can probably do the same thing. Uh, again, this is uh, very uh, difficult to tie these molecular responses to the higher orders, but again, th there's some fairly good data coming out, uh, even now from the EPA National Toxicology Program, using that their, their high-throughput battery to, to assess with whole animal endpoints to see whether or not which, which assays are the best predictors. Um, Ultimately, we want to develop this tiered framework. Um, we think this will be very powerful, at least in terms of an exposure response. Uh, for example, why go, t why go test a water uh, extract for 10,000 chemicals when 
they're not even eliciting a biological response. So if you are getting a biological response, then maybe you can use the bioassay to drive you to whatever that compound or compounds are in that particular system, sort of using what's known as a toxicity identification evaluation, which is already used for wastewater agencies. Um, and then ultimately what we'd like to do is conduct a workshop for stakeholders to sort of show you how to use these things and what the, the benefits and uh, limitations are for, for each of these. Um, the idea is to get through um, the, the water extracts by the end of the spring, uh, then actually uh, uh, start uh, running through some of the, the, uh, the uh, frameworks uh, in the latter part of the year to, to where we'd hopefully be finished uh, by spring of, of 2014. That's kind of the, the ultimate goal here. So with that, um, I'd like to thank uh, most of the folks. Uh, the top line are uh, postdocs, uh, postdoctoral technicians that are really the, the hands-on people running these things, our collaborators at uh, Life, uh, Life Technologies uh, that uh, have provided these at uh, fairly uh, um, good, uh, good cost and, and provided excellent support to us. Um, and uh, uh, our, we, our advisory, we have an external advisory panel that actually came in and advised us on, on some of the bioassays that were there. And we couldn't do this without, again, funding from, uh, from the state for this. So Jonathan and, uh, and uh, uh, Melanie are, are to be thanked as well. So with that, I'll uh, take any questions. Thank you, Dan. Uh, folks that are on the line will be able to continue this discussion past our 1230 time. Uh, you can unmute your phones, star six, ask your question, Dan and or Keith. You can also continue to send in your questions via chat. Again, star six to unmute, and then you can go ahead and send your questions via chat to host, presenter, uh, everyone. Hi, this is Ted Swift from DWR. Hi, Ted. Hey, um, could you, uh, one of the things we're interested in is water quality in the Delta as it affects drinking water, and one of the CECs we're kind of getting up to speed on on our radar is um, NDMA. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was wondering if you could go back and, and say a little bit more about yeah. what methods you found are the best for those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, Unfortunately, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Well, yeah, the, um, the one that we really, there were a few. If you actually go back to the table, we actually tried the Ames 2 assay as well and found uh, primarily through uh, uh, Shane uh, Snyder, he actually found that it was also very insensitive. So we thought, well, let's let's try the UMU, um, the UMU assay, mm -hmm. which actually has shown some success in sensitivity for some compounds, but it doesn't seem to to work real well with NDMA. And even the BAP, the benzoylpyrene, which is a polyaromatic hydrocarbon, uh, is not very active. So uh, that. Took us down to the next, <laughs> the next level, which was the P53. So let me go back to that one, and you can see that one has a little bit better uh, uh, activities. We're seeing, uh, I'd say, you know, sort of uh, uh, some sensi sensitivity responses here in about the 10 to 6, 10 to 7 uh, range for. And again, this is using uh, mitomycin, which is a um, uh, a, a DNA uh, adducting uh, compound, DNA uh, targeting um, uh, agent. So uh, it seems to work pretty well for that. We have not tried it with NDMA to try to generate a dose response curve. That should be something that we we need to uh, to look at because again we're trying to to make this for NDMA. But uh, this looks a little bit better <laughs> in terms of uh, sensitivity. But in terms of NDMA, at least with the UMO and um, 
and the Ames too, we we weren't very successful with that. Okay, thanks a lot. Sure. Do we have a question that was submitted via chat? What work is being done to link these bioassays with higher order biological effects since they only indicate exposure? Yeah, it's a good question. Um again, this it's the same it's it's the same uh issue that EPA is struggling with because they're doing the same problem for new chemical development. Um and the idea is um and and there are some publications that are coming out over the last year, primarily um uh Jettleson et al. if you really want to look uh environmental health perspectives has published a couple papers that have taken Again, this battery approach where you take this this battery of in vitro assays and then compare that against higher order a animal responses that you would say say in rats and or in you know um, acute and, and chronic uh, based uh, uh, whole animal endpoints. Um, th I'll say that that is not there for the uh, the non human health based endpoints. So what we're targeting, we're going to try to do is use that database for the human health guidance initially and then hopefully as data become available we can match that to to uh to wildlife but at this point uh suffice to say there are publications coming out that have shown uh, for some of the responses to be very strong um i i'm uh i don't want to just spill the beans but uh, some of them particularly some of the uh, the estrogen based res receptor responses are actually turning out to be fairly good there's some other um adverse outcome pathways that have shown hits in vitro that actually translate fairly well into into uh uh in vivo responses. So um the idea would be is you know as the data becomes available we'll try to put that together in, in sort of a coherent manner so that we can present that to, to stakeholders. Thank and you. Hey, this is I'll just add with from what Dan said, that is a active line of research that needs to be done, you know, in parallel with developing these techniques is how it links to higher order impacts. And as a minimum or as a default, uh, also that Dan mentioned that at worst we'll have a more efficient screening, exposure screening system, so whether we can establish links to higher order effects or not. Okay, we have time to take a few additional questions. Eric, I did see one question here with uh, chlorpyrifos being listed as a CC. I thought it was already a constituent of concern. Um, just as, and Keith can jump in any time on this, but uh, chlorpyrifos was uh, was one of those compounds where it's like, well, yeah, duh. <laughs> you know, we know it's out there. We know it's uh, it, it's actually been listed as a, as an EDC. It's on the EDC list. Um, it, but it's also uh, there are fairly robust uh, monitoring programs for that. And and one of the things we were targeted with or, or charged in that particular panel was to sort of avoid ag use compounds. We were primarily um, focused uh, more on, uh, um, again, more uh, uh, stormwater, uh, urban-based kind of endpoints, and we were asked to, to not consider uh, agricultural uh, sort of processes per se. Uh, so the compounds that are listed there are compounds that are primarily those that actually occur uh, in wastewater effluent or actually um, uh, we had monitoring data for that we could actually apply that risk-based scenario for. So that's that's why chlorpyrifos is there. It, it, it's, you know, it's kind of really a, um, a compound that could, it, it's probably already being monitored, but we, we thought we'd just uh, include it anyway because of, the, the process that we use to come up with the other compounds, and it it basically uh, exceeded risk or threshold for risk in in our scenario, so that's why that's there. I hope that helped answer that question. Thanks, Dan. Uh -huh. uh, we have another question that was submitted via chat. Is any work being done on antibiotic resistant bacteria in recycled water, also antibiotic resistant genes and their effects? Um, you want me to take that, Keith? Yeah, you go ahead. <laughs> um, work is being done. 
I'm not, of course, if you read the, the panel's recommendations, that actually, there is a recommendation for a screen that, uh, that Jeff Scott is actually developing in at NOAA for some of the, um, the antibiotic resistant genes that, uh, that are out there. One of the things that we came out with with this is that, you know, really you don't, and the complexities associated with this is that you're not really measuring the compound here as much as you're measuring the, the DNA <laughs> of the material because that gene is basically gets pre passed on into other populations. So we try to address that as, as best we could in the panel, but there really isn't a lot of data out there that, that links this to um, into a way that you can evaluate risk. Um, right now, what most uh, people are seeing is yeah, we are seeing Merced. It, it, we are seeing Merced uh, genes being transported to uh, bacterial populations. We are seeing them in bacteria. But what does that mean? Does that really mean that uh, we've got a whole population of back, of, of uh, resistant bacteria that are there, or is it just a couple organisms? There's there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty that's present there. It's something that definitely needs to be ev evaluated, and I think. Um, you know, I'm I'm a scientist, so we're all always going to say we need more research. But I'd say if you you know one of the t I think this is something that really needs to to be explored. Uh, we need to kind of come up with a so what on this. But there are panels, screening bioassay panels for these particular materials that are being developed. Uh, and I I will, uh, you know, stop there. Keith, I don't know if you want to add anything on that. But. No, just to reiterate that it is sort of an open. Uh, quote, specialty topic, and as Dan said, uh, the, the whole nature and, and ramifications of antibiotic resistance needs to be uh, addressed with a focused group as opposed to a, a, a chemical group, I would say. <laughs>